Um, so, I told you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was really a wonderful, wonderful presentation, and I'm not going to take up too much time because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions from the floor. My job is just to introduce the discussion. And I think I want to make two questions. Um, before getting to those questions, though, just to say, there's the overwhelming impression that one gets when listening to you and also um, studying um, the, the, the literature in general in this exciting field that you're working in. Is a I don't need that anymore. It's not just the computer started to slide down the hill, and I think that that might end in tears. <laughs> um, is how central to everything memory is. You know, it really is in that. I mean, no doubt this is why you decided to devote your life's work to it, but it's such an absolutely fundamental topic, um, fundamental to, to everything about mental life. Um, that it's easy to lose sight of that fact, it's so obvious. You know, it's, um, one of the best ways, well there are two ways to illustrate that. The one is in, in, in my clinical work, where, where I work with neurological and, and neurosurgical patients. They, they, it's, it's incredible how often um, the patients come into my office and tell me that their presenting complaint is memory problems. Patients experience just about everything as memory problems. So a patient who has an apraxia, which is a disorder of still movement, to me, to them, it's a memory problem. I can't remember how to move properly. Or a patient with an anomia, which to me is a language disorder, they tell me, you know, when I say, what, you know, what, what difficulties do you have since your stroke or whatever, they say they have memory problems because, of course, that's actually exactly what all of these disorders are. We have this narrow category uh, nosologically called memory disorders, but basically all cognitive disorders, one way or another, are memory disorders. And you can broaden the scope of that, as I, as I see Christina really does, uh, to say that the whole of psychiatry and psychoanalysis certainly, in one way or another, deals with memory problems. Problems of elaborations of difficulties arising from the fact of memory. You could say, in fact, Freud more or less defines the ego as opposed to the id on those grounds. The ego is that which is acquired. The id is that which is given, uh, as it were, genetically, and then it is exposed to a particular reality, and the ego forms you know, between the id and the reality that, that it's exposed to. So in a word, the whole of the ego, uh, and therefore the whole of mental life in relation to um, you know, what's given by our genes, uh, is, in, is, is, is not to put too fine a point on it, Varieties of memory or aspects of memory function. Um, so, you know, the work that you're doing, the work that, that Christina and others in that area are doing, is you know, astonishingly important for, for us as psychoanalysts, for us as mental scientists of any kind, and for us as human beings. Indeed, I'd go so far as to say for us as biological creatures, full stop. And that leads me to the first of my two questions, which goes in a kind of direction of reducing down to a simpler level. And the other question goes, in the other direction. Um, I wanted to ask you, and it's only because I'm allowed to because I'm up here, you know, sort of cheating because it's not a particularly relevant question, it's just the question that occurs to me. You speak of these basic cellular mechanisms as being deeply evolutionarily conserved, that these are ancient, ancient mechanisms that go all the way down um, to, and that in a way is my question, to where? Um, it, uh, are, are memory mechanisms, uh, do you have to have specialized nerve cells for memory? Are there, are there memory processes that precede the formation uh, of, a, of, 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 a, of, of specialized cells uh, which, which, uh, which, we, which we will then call neurons? Uh, or are there, all, are there memory processes that precede that, um, as it were, evolutionarily? I, I know you're an immunologist, and that's in fact the first thing that springs to mind, is to what extent might immune system processes be considered memory processes? In what way do they differ from what we call memory processes in, in neurosciences? Um, and in a, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to take it further and to ask, um, is it only um, in the animal kingdom that we have memory? Is there anything equivalent to memory in the plant kingdom? And if there isn't, why is it that something about animate life that requires memory? I think, uh, as I say, I'm taking advantage of my position as discussing to ask my own particular science fiction questions that interest me. But um, there you go, you've got to have some rewards for your job. Um, taking it in the other direction, um, 
and, to, and leading to my second question. I think that uh, when we, uh, when one listens to what you have to say about the dynamics of the memory trace, it's, it's both sort of gratifying to us who, who think psychodynamically, but also pretty darn alarming. You know, it's sort of Jesus, the whole thing's so dynamic. Then you know, where does it? You know, what, what can I cling to? Um, and that makes the psychoanalyst aware uh, or think of the extent to which memory is fallible. I mean, it's not uh, as much as, as you say, memory serves these very important biological functions in terms of learning, you know, where to get the good stuff and, and, and what to avoid in order to stay around, in order to get the good stuff. Um, you know, and therefore it's terribly important that you learn veridically. Um, we also know from, from our uh, clinical work just how how uh, ubiquitous is misremembering, how, how subject to distortion is memory. And um, what, what, um, what both of those facts point to, both the, 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 the biological importance of veridical memory, but also the clinical fact of distorted memory, both of them point to the enormously important role of motivational factors in memory. Um, you know, memory, because of the cognitive paradigm that we all kind of subject to in this day and age. You know, we think of it a little bit too much in sort of information processing, computer system sort of uh, points of view, and forget these, these more um, um, visceral biological factors, the, the, the affective factors that you refer to. I see in all of your drawings the nucleus accumbens seems to be more central to everything than the blooming amygdala, I mean a hippocampus does. So I mean, my question just is, what can you tell us about the, the, what you're learning at the, at the, at the um, you know, molecular and, 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 and uh, to general neurobiological level about the role of dopamine and the role of other motivational uh, factors in memory. And a last thought along those lines is when you think about the sort of alarming uh, aspects of the motivational uh, uh, and dynamic um, um, fallibilities of memory, um, the, the, uh, the role of what we in psychoanalysis call reality testing. I don't know if there's anything in neurobiology of memory which, which relates to the concept or which can begin to be operationalized in relation to the concept of reality testing because I think for us that's sort of the counterpoint. You know, there's, there's memory motive structures where wish dominates and then there's reality, the reality principle and reality testing as the kind of mechanism by which the reality principle operates uh, in, in, in our metapsychological understanding of memory. I think it's an important point. I, I don't know beyond the sort of vague way in which I put it, how, how to operationalize, how to turn it into a more precise way of thinking, but I suspect it's an important point, not only by way of experimental design and trying to understand better the other side of this dynamic, you know, what, what constrains the dynamic, um, but um, the motivational aspects, that is. But also, I think, an ethical aspect, because whenever you speak of reconsolidation, whenever I hear people speaking of reconsolidation and, and consolidation, it's also a gleeful, you know, ooh, we can interfere with them. I start thinking, geez, is that really a good thing? And uh, so the ethical side of it, I think, somehow also relates ultimately to this question of reality testing and the reality principle, because in psychoanalysis, the ethical principle that we follow in fiddling with our patients' memories is trying to get to what's real, you know, as far as possible. It's the, 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 the value system that we, that we start with is that, you know, um, it's best to know what really happened. And that best equips you to be able to cope. So those are my questions to get the ball rolling. Maybe you want to respond to those while I start taking the mic around there. Is this new mic? This is the one I take it out of here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And you really touched upon very important issues uh, on memory. So I'm going to start with the first one and how evolution has used memory mechanisms? Are there memories in cells that are not even neurons? And the answer in, in, is yes. Uh, it could be semantic, obviously, at one point. But the answer is yes in the sense that single cells, like bacteria, or cells that are not so differentiated, not so specialized, they can respond to certain stimuli and make those responses long-lasting. I mean, a certain type of stimuli are going to induce a genetic program 
that will lead to long-lasting changes in the cell. That's the first type of mechanism that actually leads to long-term memories, even in neurons. So obviously we talk about memories behaviorally, <clears throat> but at the cellular and at the molecular level, what happens is that there is a number of changes that occurs first in the gene expression, at the gene expression level that translate then into morphological changes of the neurons and the astrocytes and the glia in the brain that are long lasting. So those morphological changes, particularly in the context of the cells, the synapses, are believed, because they have been seen, to parallel the storage of the information for how long the information is retained. Therefore, those changes in the cellular mechanism and the morphological mechanism, the synaptic morphological changes, are the building blocks of the behavioral memories we see. There are obviously a number of other levels that have to come together. The synapses talk to each other. The networks of synapses are going to do what they need to do in terms of then create the response, the behavioral response, the memory retrieval, the behavioral response from which we test the memory retrieval. So yes, there is a very conserved, very old cellular mechanism that lead to long-lasting changes in the cell. And it's very interesting that the way we started to discover the mechanism involving longer memory formation was to use very simple systems, invertebrates, like the cisne, Aplysia californica, you have probably heard that it that. I worked in his lab, so I know the old history of uh, Or the fruit fly, Rosophila melanogaster, that's the, you know, the small fruit fly that goes around in, in the summer. And, and those uh, creatures are used in the lab because they are wonderful genetic models. They can, in the lab, scientists, make mutations, uh, random mutation, and isolate behavioral mutants that have no memories or super memories, and very easily they can then go back into their genes and find which gene was mutated, was changed. That would give us information about the gene contribution, the gene expression contribution to memory, which is important. We know new messenger RNA, new proteins, the manipulation of the genes is important for this type of long-lasting memory, the retention, which is a very ancient cellular mechanism. Obviously, when we talk about memories in humans, they're going to be much more complex. It's not just those type of mechanisms. It's that in addition, there is more specialized things happening in neurons uh, than in bacteria. So there is something that overlaps, something that differentiates to give complexity over evolution. And that's what happens. So the Aplysia and the Drosophila helped us to identify the first molecular mechanism that we could find important for long-term memory. But then after that, we started to go more in complex system and say, OK, those are also required for long-term memories in mammalian system in the rat, even in humans. But what else? And this is what exactly we are doing. What else? And this is how we can then cross talk. We can look at the cross talk between those mechanisms and, for example, modulation by stress, by emotions, because then the, our nervous system became more complex. We evolved to have an hippocampus that processes places and an amygdala that processes emotions so that we can make these uh, associations between the place and an emotional data. Maybe motivational. That's the other thing. So there are not only negative emotions there. We need to be motivated to remember how to do things. And obviously dopamine is very important. Uh, there is much less known about those memories because they are less strong. So it's much easier to reproduce a memory of a shocking event in one single exposure than a memory of something incentive. We have to give them a few times to see a nice strength of the memory that we can measure. So it's just practical, but we're going to get there. So the way we do that, and we did, because we became interested in looking at positively charged memories, uh, we use drugs of abuse. 
So if we did cocaine or morphine together with our experience, they, that experience becomes much more salient, much more appealing because of the effect of the drug. And the effect of the drug, which goes through dopamine, we know it's an incentive. Uh, so it's not aversive, uh, it's an incentive memory. So we even ask the question, can we disrupt those memories through reconsolidation? And the answer is yes. So if they get into an addicted state, and so they, they, they crave for that experience, uh, we can actually decrease the intensity of those memories. But again, we are talking about extremes here, trauma, addiction. What we want to know is also to go in between. But we, we, certainly we can learn from the extreme what are the type of mechanisms that are modulated. Uh, are memories real? What reality has got to do with memories? And that's a very interesting topic. Obviously, reality testing is, uh, you know, it tells us whether we are completely out of reality or not. So, it's an important distinction. But it is also true that we mix and match the memories. Our memories are not true. And the reason is that our system that makes long-term memory is very efficient, but not that efficient as we imagine today. We actually mostly forget rather than remember, and that's very healthy. So we don't want to intensify the memories too much, right? Because actually we don't know, we're going to test it in the lab, we may interfere with the efficiency of the system to do other things. If we strengthen too much the memories, we don't know yet, it's a right part. But also we want to forget. Why do we have to remember all that? Stop, anyway. We have to remember the important information that will lead us to be adopted. But otherwise, we don't need to remember. That's why we need to remember. That's why we have long-term memories, is to extract the information that is important. So that's what we do. Even the memories that we think, they are so detailed. If you really, really think about it, after some time, a number of details remain. But we have lost so much, and then we just fill the gaps. We come up with things when we tell the stories, and that's what we do. But the memory is only traced by a few notes, a few things. And then when we tell the story, we fill up the gaps. So those are not true. Those are our interpretation. It's always about an interpretation. There is a base for it. The reality testing is a different thing, right? They come up with things that never happen. That's not what happens. We don't come up with things that never happen, meaning the whole fact, but we only have a few things, and then the rest is filled in by our fantasy. Thank you. We have a question for the one or two. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a few questions of different types. Uh, in relation to how far down does it go, uh, have you looked into the recent research in uh, cancer metastasis that identifies what's been described as an ancient toolkit by which certain uh, strains of cancer cells do the exploration uh, to find a new niche, which then pass on to other strains, which then uh, actually invade and stay stable. And it's remarkably similar to new innovation uh, uh, neural innovation uh, when a new area is uh, connected to uh, an originating area. So that's that's the that's the setup for the next question, which is uh, how important is the connectivity between distal areas? We know that certain micro deletions can uh, affect in genetic expression. Connectivity between distal brain areas and affect everything from autism to memory issues to Alzheimer's. So that's the one question. The second is, uh, have you, uh, what is your view of the application of your research to uh, those with identical photographic memories, not necessarily autistic savants, which clearly have given up certain functionality, but those who have not? And lastly, uh, those memories which involve both implicit and explicit, such as memories of a childhood house. The facts are the address, the events, what happened there. But the procedural memories, getting back and forth to school, 
So they're integrated into a complex of meta memories and how your research might affect that. In terms of the, the first question, um, I'm not familiar with the cancer research, but I would guess that's related to neurogenesis, right? So the, the formation of new neurons. Uh, it, it was believed until a few years ago that our brain makes new neurons only during development and then after a certain age. <clears throat> the neurons we have, that's it. We have to deal with that and we're actually going to lose neurons over time. It turns out it's not true. It's more about how they target a new area to innovate. Right, right. So uh, we know now that certain areas, like part of the hippocampus uh, and other areas, can generate new neurons. And these neurons migrate into the right place and integrate with the existing circuitry to, to also contribute to memories. Uh, it's a fascinating area. Uh, we know that that happens. We know that memories, what they do, they don't really increase <coughs> neurogenesis, the new neurons, but they decrease the loss of the new neurons. So these neurons stay alive and integrate much more if we practice, if we learn, if we do. So that's why activity of the brain is a wonderful thing against all the diseases, aging, losses, uh, because in addition to activate what we already have through a number of growth factors, those are important factors for long-term memories and functioning of the brain, we also increase neurogenesis. Exercise is another way to do that. And those integrate <coughs> with our circuitry and probably, you know, over a long period of time, we use a lot of more neurons which integrates in, in the system. So I think that's, that's what you were referring to. Um, remind me the uh, second question, please. Uh, the second was about eidetic memory. I don't know which was second, but it's eidetic memory. And uh, then the other one had to do with uh, memories that involve both implicit and explicit or procedural. <coughs> right. Uh, so we... Uh, at, at the level of, of mechanisms, we try to separate the components because we want to know what mechanisms support which component. But definitely the complex memories are obviously integrating all those aspects. So we are going to separate obviously explicit from implicit, but in the real world then we use them all and integrate them. We know that lesion of certain brain regions only affect certain types of memories and not others. So that's how we distinguish that. But then in the real life, if we actually affect one, most likely over time something is going to affect the other one as well. Even though they are, you know, it, to some extent they are separate in terms of processing. So uh, in the lab we, we like to separate right now. And I'm sure that in a few years after we understand the single component, we want to go back and see how the integration works. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you raised the question as to what was happening with the animal in the seven day period after it's learned this avoidance response and its memory seems to strengthen. Yes. Uh, would you accept the hypothesis that since this is a, uh, an experience that um, is significant for the survival of this animal, that, um, uh, that during REM sleep, this is memory is being revived and reconsolidated? Yes, yes, you, in fact, thank you for bringing that up. There is a, a, you know, there are a number of studies looking, in fact, at the replay of the traces during sleep. And some memories replay more during the REM sleep, and some others not during the non-REM sleep, depending on the type of memories. Uh, and scientists do record and look at the replay of these traces, and it seems that really the same trace that has been stimulated during learning, they are mostly reactivated or at least in part reactivated during sleep. So an hypothesis is saying that that's how we strengthen the memories. And interestingly, we, we look at gene expression and all the biology of the brain and what we found is that if we block these biological changes, we interfere with the consolidation if we do that throughout more than, for more than 24 hours. So the time window that actually requires 
gene expression changes for consolidation last for more than 24 hours. That's very interesting. What happens over 24 hours? Sleep, mm -hmm. circadian rhythm. That's another one. So the surge of hormones through circadian rhythm could be another important mechanism that intersect or cross talk with sleep and the replay of the traces. Uh, so certainly those are the mechanisms we are looking at. We know they are important. We have to dissect the uh, single components. So sleep, reactivation of the traces, that's very important. So what happens over a week? That's another question. Over one day, we know that, first of all, we have to filter that. And the first 24 hours are very important. But then there is something else going on for a week. And we believe that that's probably, in this case, what the hippocampus is doing. Over a few weeks, these memories become less hippocampal dependent, more cortical dependent. Mm -hmm. We don't have the proof, but the time frame really overlaps with that type of processing. So, while the hippocampus is still very important, that's probably the phase during which we can strengthen the memory, disrupt the memories, and that's what happens in a normal memory that consolidates. So we think that during the first week, memory reactivation, probably through sleep or even just thinking about it. You mentioned this is a very important memory, we need to make it long term. One way to do that, and avoiding to re-experience the same thing, we don't want to be shocked too many times. So we don't want to encounter the lion too many times. Once is enough. Then just reactivating the memory of it could be the way to strengthen it. So that's why we think about all oh, that unpleasant experience again and again. And then after a while it fades, right? And that's healthy. It has to fade. We have to forget. That's why we have to forget. Yeah, this is a, perhaps a little provocative, but let me ask, I think it's pertinent. Uh, we humans, of course, communicate with explicit, uh, via explicit memory, uh, and also procedural, but uh, animals only use procedural. So working with rats strikes me, since procedural memory bypasses uh, the hippocampus, as we saw with you know, DM, uh, the, the guy who had the temporal lobes removed, uh, it strikes me that, that working with rats in memory, you're dealing only with procedural memory, which would not involve the hippocampus. So I was wondering what you would, would say. Yeah, so it's more difficult to you uh, investigate this mechanism with procedural to begin with, because we really didn't know what type of mechanism were involved. So that's why we chose to look at the hippocampal dependent memory, which is, for example, this context fear association. Uh, but obviously we want to know how procedural memory works and we know from like genetic models that also some of the mechanisms are used for this type of memories are also important for procedural but much less is known and probably the ones we know that they are used by all these systems are the fundamental ones right? the, one, the ancient ones we were talking about the ones that create certain shapes of synapses that maintain the information. But we know certainly much less about the procedural memories. And we also want to reproduce these hippocampal dependent memories because they are more relevant for clinical understanding. But yes, it's important, definitely, we go that direction too. Hi. So as analysts, when someone comes uh, to work with us, say, a brand trauma veteran, we're going to help them talk about their trauma, talk about their experiences. So my understanding from your talk was, you know, talking about reconsolidation and creating new memories, you discussed mostly pharmacology and behavioral techniques. So how does our work, um, can you discuss a little bit about how our work would work with the reconsolidation and the new memories of helping them to process and talk about their experience? Yeah. <coughs> What we know from this model, I would say that we know that reconsolidation strengthens the memory. So if the uh, subject comes and the memory is very recent, uh, reactivating the memory is going to strengthen the memory. But if the exposure is long enough, it's going to also create an extinction. So those are two different types of mechanisms occurring at the same time. They're going to have the emotion coming up again. 
that part would strengthen the memory. But if the emotion is calmed down in the session, mm. it would most likely really trigger more of an extinction, meaning it's not happening again right here, right now. So depending on the emotional state, we can try to work and know that the two types of mechanism are not, you know, are, have, can happen at the same time, but we want to guide toward one or the other, depending in the, in the initial phase, I would say, toward the extinction, toward the calming down of the emotions, because those are the mechanisms that strengthen the memory. When the memory is older, it depends on what they evoke, what happens in the room, and uh, a number of things may happen. First of all, over time is clearly the recall of the memory activates more of an extinction type of mechanism. I showed you that four weeks later, if we remind them even briefly, they actually extinguish much more easily. So waiting some time and giving it time, you know that time is important. With repetition, uh, it's important to lead, to create these new memory traces that are more of an extinction type of memory, uh, softening the emotional uh, difficulty of the trauma. We can even think about interfering. So sometimes if the memory comes up very strongly and the emotion is very strong, then we can start to think about how to interfere with the consolidation because that's what most likely is going on in that moment. So thinking about all these components, I think it will, can be helpful to drive the type of intervention. Time, emotional state, uh, strength of the emotion, and age of the memory. And sometimes, you know, traumatic memories, that's why we don't recall them. You know, they are there and they are repressed, <coughs> probably, they are suppressed. Because coming back is, uh, is, is, is too painful. So that's why the setting, the psychoanalytic setting is important because it will deal with the emotion, the emotional charge coming up, which if not, it will lead to a strengthening and probably an out of control strengthening of the process. So depending on all, all this, I think it, it can be interesting to think about ways to use it in clinical settings. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my question uh, has to do with the governing processes, the control over retrieval of memory, which is very important in our analytical work. Now, <clears throat> I was, um, you know, very fascinated and I'm aware of some of the things that you mentioned about memory at all levels from even cellular or subcellular level at different components of the cells all the way to the brain to the neuron and so on and different structures in the brain but and and just to make a parallel we know now from electronics and cybernetics that um, emails, for instance, are not transmitted as a package, a whole message, but split up first and transmitted through different networks and then really consolidated or re-compounded. Uh, it looks like this means very much what we know about the brain. My question is, um, what is the governing, what is your view about the governing mechanisms what makes us able to retrieve volition? And also, what is the role of language in this? Because we know that memory is lost, or at least the perception of loss of memory, very different depending on what kind of aphasia a person has. Um, yes, I, I, do, I don't know much about language because mostly we focus on these mechanisms and the integration of this mechanism from molecules to circuitry in the animal. So I, I'm not really qualified to address the question about the language. I can tell you what I think and what I, the, the little I know. Uh, 
in terms of the mechanism, that's, that's exactly what we think it happens. We uh, learn information, we have to decode them in some sort of signaling that happens throughout the brain circuitry. And then over time this changes, they're going to create some sort of long-lasting change, which as I mentioned requires more than 24 hours to begin with and then builds up over days during the first week. So the first one is at the cellular level, the second one is at the circuit level, and then it changes, the distribution of this information changes over time throughout the brain. That's what we know from this type of memories. Obviously the more complex the memory is, the more strata we're going to find. And some of them are going to be regulated in a certain time frame, some with others. So obviously the complex formation of the memories. And then the retrieval, which is what you mentioned. We know very little about retrieval. We know about consolidation and reconsolidation. But what happens when we retrieve the memory? We know very little about that, very important. That's a very, very important question to study. Uh, so in terms of language, uh, because language is so important in all our functions, it's obviously connected with all the memory systems. And so uh, having a deficit in memory systems or in language is going to affect the regulation and the expression of it. Uh, that as much as I'm going to go, because I don't want to really talk about what I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. This is a great talk. So I just want to say, first of all, actually animals, mammals, especially rats, do have much more than procedural memory. Yes. So, so rats are capable of doing cognitive processes, of learning symbolic associations, and so on. So I just wanted to add that to the discussion. Um, and also, I think one of the very important implications of, of the work that you're doing is that it showed me, first of all, that we should never draw conclusions from one or two experiments. Because if you had just stopped after your first couple of experiments, we would have drawn a lot of different conclusions than once you look at all of the different intersections between time and reminders and all of that. So in terms of applying it to the analytic process, I'm sure there are even additional axes of complexity, you know. But it seems to me that one of the things that's relevant for me is the whole idea of object relations and the extent to which if we have internalized representations of the self and the other that are out of awareness, that continue to be activated and reactivated over time, presumably they're getting more and more strengthened. But then in the analytic process or some other kind of process where you can bring a new awareness, you can have new experiences, then something is open to change. Um, and the, the ways in which the different systems interact to facilitate change, I think, is such an important thing to, for us to continue to explore. Then I, you know, I wanted to ask you perhaps an unfair question that's aside from your research in particular, but the, one of the things that was so striking from the videos is how emotionally impactful it is for people to have those memory disturbances. And it seemed like there were two very strong affects. One was a very strong affect of embarrassment, that there was something really embarrassing and frustrating to the people when they couldn't remember something. And then also it was just so poignant to not be able to remember your own wedding almost made me cry, you know? So I'm just wondering if from a systems point of view, if you have any speculations about how not being able to remember something that you know that you should be able to remember, how does that trigger affective distress? I know that might be way too speculative, but... Yeah. Now, it, it, it is obviously an interesting question, but what you reminded me with the first, your, your first uh, comment is actually how important is that we understand the memories that forms during development. We are looking here at young adults, but the memories that form over developmental phases, they may be really not be regulated by the same mechanisms, or obviously the fundamental ones are going to be the same. 
But the memory systems, we know that they are not in place in the same way. For example, there is no connection for some time between amygdala and hippocampus. So they obviously, these animals, or we, uh, when we grow up, we experience pain and stress, but we don't really process that cognitively, or we don't put that in places <clears throat> so much because those associations are not developed yet. So looking, for example, at memories, and obviously traumatic memories over development is, is, is going to be tremendously important. I'm sure you must have had a number of speakers talking about that. And uh, it's obvious that we need to also understand the biology of it. It's not going to be exactly the same as in the adulthood. So how to process memories in the adulthood, and then how to recall the memories in analytic setting in adulthood. But also knowing what happened over development and maybe why certain memories are going to be uh, repressed or suppressed uh, because it's actually an advantage to do that for survival, right? I mean, in the animal models we know I don't know if you know Regina Sullivan's work, right? These rats that are less than nine days old, uh, they develop an attraction, an approach for the mothers, even if they give them an electric shock together with the mother. So something that then they develop an avoidance, obviously. We do avoid painful experiences. But if, when they are very, very young, they actually develop an approach. And, they study all this interesting mechanism of the level of stress and how that changes and how the presence of the mother changes the level of cort, the, the stress hormone, and therefore switches this memory system toward one or another type of behavior. Why do they develop an approach? Well, guess what? If they reject their mother, they're going to die, right? So they have to stick to it. So obviously we need to know so much more also about how memory mechanism evolved during development. And this may not be it. So that's another important thing that we need to know. Um, comment about Uh, I think that's probably, I know this is my, it's an interpretation of, personal interpretation. I think it's everything we measure to like, I'm not able to do, we have to feel embarrassed about. And obviously a disease or a, a you know, physical impairment is an embarrassment. So I don't think it's only for memory, but any kind of this physical impairment will bring some sort of uh, similar emotion and embarrassed that are not mm -hmm. sufficiently good enough. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I, I would say that that's probably my answer to that. Could you comment about, um, could you comment about drug abuse, the motivation for drug abuse or alcohol abuse? and the desire to forget in terms of the trauma? Uh, yeah, so it's known that uh, traumatic experiences, the particular trauma uh, during young age can lead to the drug abuse in adulthood. That's even found in animal models actually. Uh, so stress and trauma lead to seeking reward, easy reward, if they try drugs, that's induces a very strong memory of the reward and then they become dependent much more easily. Uh, I don't think the mechanism are known, at, at least as far as I know, but certainly the interaction between the stress system, glucocorticoids are very important for shaping the brain, for modulating the responses, uh, and, for, and, and release of neurotransmitters like dopamine. So the drug of abuse activates the dopamine and really takes over. And the dopamine system becomes crazy. And then when there are these reminders that they can be physical or they can be even psychological, they go into craving and relapse. So even in that case, memory is actually very important because the reminders of cues 
uh, associated with the effect of the drugs lead to craving and relapse. And this is what we are actually interested in looking at. But definitely there is a, a very important component that has to do with trauma, stress, and this type of mechanism of memory that are, that are probably altered, some of which we know they are definitely altered in a state of drug of abuse. And initially, there are certain changes after an acute use, but after a chronic use, they become even different. So there is an over time, overall physical change in the brain that comes with the, the abuse and these type of substances. And the over hyperactivation of the dopamine system. Yeah, that's what we don't know. That's why I was saying we really need to know much more about what are the mechanisms that happen in the brain uh, during development for memory, for reward, for trauma, for stress. And the connection is not just about the uh, molecular mechanism at the cellular level, it's about also the circuitry, which develops over time. So we really need to know much more. It is much less known than what we know about the young adults. Um, in, uh, in your discussion, one of the interesting things is that uh, there's the issue of what memory is in, in terms of its relationship to the brain. And um, like light or tactile sensations in early childhood at the earliest basis, it's an organizing effect to help organize the, the neural system. And so memory, to some degree, is not for the purpose of regurgitation of information, but to be able to organize a certain cerebral state, a certain uh, level of function. And it seems to me that uh, under those circumstances, the thousands of memories that were or experiences that we're having, which we call memories, but may not be memories because within this cerebral context, they simply need the organizing uh, an overall state and not necessarily essentially be there for the purpose of experience. And this in turn could have a very important effect, let's say, um, in the field for a mouse that has a, a bad experience, which is able to communicate that to the group of mice that forages with. And it has nothing to do with calling it, but altering behavior that's never going to refer to it. And, and for no reason that's going to be transferred. Rather, it's going to be a positive feed forward mechanism. And in that sense, that leads then to another problem, which is most human beings um, don't uh, navigate by recall, but by worldview. And they have a bias or a sort of philosophy. And it's through that lens that they tend to perceive things and decide what they saw or what they felt. And so to some degree, that's also the residual effect of having this memory conditioning. But the accuracy of, of the conditioned memories that are utilized to form the basis of this worldview are so far distant that one could say they're fictional uh, narratives that are used to understand the world, which then contribute to brief moments in which they would call something, but only through that lens. Yes, I, and, and, and I agree, you really touched upon uh, how is the brain organized? The brain is organized through those types, I would call them memories actually, because it is shaping the circuitry through all the sensations, through all the sensory systems, auditory systems, smell, touch, all of them. And that's how the synapses are formed, and that's how they're strengthened. So if we repeat certain things, that's how we're going to form these very strong connections. And those are going to remain. That's our hard drive. We're going to have different hard drives, depending on what we went through. But those are memories, right? And that, those are then the system that we use to make more sophisticated, more declarative memories, the recall of it. Those are details. Those are not even particularly changing much of the hard drive, we use them from time to time, and that's why they're probably so inaccurate. That's why I'm saying 
the, our brain is very efficient, but that's not what we are born for. We is not to remember the details. It's to remember the semantics of it, the definition, the, to extract the rules. And those are different connections. Those are the old memories. That's why we forget them and we make up the rules. And this is how then we use them to operate in the world. But those are memories too. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I have just a, a comment and a question. I never worked in a lab before, uh, but I really felt to an amazing degree. It's like you took me by the hand and walked me through every stage of what a person in a lab would do, how they think, what the first hypothesis is, what the second is. It was almost like we were writing a short story in addition to the talk about a day of life in the lab. I really felt that I knew more about what it was like to work in a lab from your talk than any neuroscientist I've ever uh, listened to. So it was, a, it was an amazing example of thoroughness and patience, and also the way that you answer questions. A lot of neuroscientists are much more interested when they come, they all know their stuff, but they're much more interested in their answers than the questions. You really listen to what people say, and I feel you're really interested in understanding, even if they're totally wrong, and you disagree, you really want to understand what the person is saying. It's a delight to just listen to your presence and see that you present yourself this way, in addition to being a great expert. So I just want to comment on that. Um, so my question is a follow-up to what Maggie said, because uh, I was I will always remember, 10 years from now, if my, you know, if my memory's intact, I will always remember EP and the thing with the guy who went from being like a distinguished scientist or worker in electronics to suddenly radically brain damage, when he said about a half a dozen times, uh, went from six feet to you know, miniaturization, and, went, and it was so shocking, you know, and the embarrassment that Maggie said, I, I couldn't help thinking. My question is about that. Has EP looked at this film, or if he hasn't, if you can imagine, if he did look at the film, I know he'd forget it in a second, but if you saw that section where it was, I mean, I couldn't think of a more powerful visual um, testimony to radical brain damage of how he's, he said that six times. Would he for a second acknowledge, understand conceptually that he had radical brain damage for short-term memory? Or would he make a patent confabulation like, gee, I tend to get very excited and repeat myself, but total denial. So, uh, Another quick question. I thought Eric Kendall won his Nobel Prize for showing the link between molecule and cellular memory consolidation. I thought that was the first lowest level Eric Kendall brought it to. So that's the question. Yes. Uh, yeah, important question about the issue is that the EP. Uh, you know, he's clearly aware of his condition because of the embarrassment. He shows that, and when he says, uh, what's her name? Do you remember her name? Jennifer, and he doesn't, and he's clearly embarrassed. That, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But he forgets very quickly. So most likely, even if he saw the interviews and the videos, what happens is that he's aware of but there are bits and pieces because then we forget, quickly forget. Um, so I think they definitely, also the emotional part of the brain is, the brain is, is damaged. And maybe it's the connection between the hippocampus and the emotional part of the brain. I, mean, I, I don't know enough about their imaging studies, for example, if they even know that. Uh, they're trying to understand how the memory systems are impaired here in, in this case. Uh, so, and the same is for the other patient, right? He's, he's clearly aware of his condition. Um, and it's shocking to see how he tries so hard to remember. Uh, but then, because of the type of damage, they really don't consolidate what just happened a few hours ago. He's going to forget. So when they ask him, re repeat this, list of words if they can repeat or they ask what did you with, what did I tell you a few hours ago they don't remember so they also forget the emotional state and yes it is true that uh, one of the first uh, evidence at the cellular level the identification of the molecular mechanism in consultation was done 
uh, by Eric Kandel's lab in Apisia, as well as in Drosophila. They really came in part of that, the same, at the same, during the same age. And uh, while in Eric's lab there was more uh, an identification of the molecular steps, what leads to what, from step one to step two and three and so on, at the cellular level, in the Drosophila it was more the discovery of what's mutated, uh, that is linked to memory loss. So the measure in the Aplysia system was really a cellular measure of memory. So they look at synaptic function. We look at, I, I was there a long time. Uh, in the Drosophila system, they look at the genes involved in memory. But it was really brought up in parallel. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful piece of neuroscience history. <laughs> So I, I thought that the, um, the last comment from the member of the audience, the love letter about how you, you uh, favorably you compare to, to uh, our other neuroscientific speakers in how you um, how considerate you are of the audience's ability to understand the narrative and how you went from one conclusion to the next and how each study followed from the findings of the earlier one. How empathic you are with all of us is an apt point to stop and, uh, and also a, 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 an opportunity for me to remind you of something I didn't say in the introduction, which is that Dr. Alberini is also training as a psychoanalyst, which I think is a truly remarkable thing to be uh, for the future. Thank you. And this was our last meeting, as I told you, until after the summer break. <laughs>